All right, guys, welcome back. We're now in session 33. We're going to take some time in this session to look at some really amazing, absolutely amazing passages, specifically Isaiah 63 as well as Isaiah 66. Um, Isaiah 63 is amazing because some of the previous desert prophecies that we've looked at, uh, people look at them and they, at first, unless they really do the study, unless they see, oh my gosh, this is everywhere. If they just look at it on the surface, they go, I don't know that that's talking about the return of Jesus. Is that really talk? Isaiah 63, you can't deny it. Like you can't get around it. Like you go either Isaiah is just painting a picture that's totally not real at all. It'll never happen. Or it's describing the return of Jesus. Like there's just no way to get around it. So Isaiah 63 verses 1 through 3. Isaiah is essentially from the vantage point of Judah, Jerusalem. He's looking south toward Sinai. He's looking south toward modern-day Jordan, modern-day Saudi Arabia, from the region of Edom. And he says, who is this coming up from Edom? Who is this one that's marching forward from the land of Edom? We've seen Edom already multiple times. Um, we've seen that, that term. And then he says, with his garments of glowing colors from Basra. Again, we've looked at Basra. Basra is the sheepfold. It's down there close to Petra in modern-day Jordan. We've seen these terms, Edom, Seir, Timan, Basra, Sinai. We've seen all of these terms. They're all pointing to the south. We saw it in Deuteronomy 33, Judges 5, Psalm 68. We saw it in Micah 2. Here Isaiah is just bringing it up again. Micah and Isaiah prophesied roughly in the same time period. I'm not exactly even sure who came first. And then Isaiah says, this one who is majestic in his apparel, marching forward in the greatness of his strength. This is Jesus. And then he responds, he says, it is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save, like finally. He's here, he's on the ground, he's marching. Isaiah's like, what am I seeing here? What am I seeing here? Isaiah 59, by the way, just previously, just a few chapters earlier, and we don't know necessarily, uh, I don't know that I have total confidence in terms of the arrangement of the prophecies of Isaiah. Are they all arranged chronologically from the way that he got them, etc.? Probably not. But Isaiah 59 very well may have come just before Isaiah 63. So back there in Isaiah 59, verse 17, it spoke of the arm of the Lord putting on garments of vengeance and zeal. The zeal of the Lord is the passion of God for all of these things, for the day of justice, to give us relief, to bring relief, to bring, um, yeah, just refreshment to, the, to those that are persecuted, to those that are groaning and crying out to him, millions upon millions throughout the earth, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Like, I love that. Like, do you want to know what's going to... It's his fiery... Pa he cares. It says, Jesus will put on the garments of vengeance and zeal as a mantle on that day. It's absolutely beautiful. So here is, he's marching forward. And so Isaiah is looking and he says... Well, Hold on now. <laughs> Why are your garments vivid red? Why are they bright red? Like someone who's been treading the wine press all day. So, you know, obviously back in the day, the wine press would sort of be like a big stone bowl or something like that, and people would get in and stomp it with their feet. Now, you want to wear your work clothes when you do that because you will ruin your good clothes. Like your clothes by the end of the day will be covered with the blood of the grapes, right? The sangria. Like, you can't do that job without being soaked with juice. Well, here he's using that imagery, as we'll see. It's not grapes. Isaiah goes, why do you look like you've been stomping grapes all day? And he says, I have trodden the wine trough, the wine press, alone. From the nations, from the peoples, there was no one with me. Like, no one supported me in this. And then he says, I trod them in my anger. Who? The nations, his enemies. I squished them like grapes. That's what he's saying. My enemies, I trampled them down in my wrath. And their blood, their life blood, spattered all of my garments. So why am I soaked in bright red? It's blood of his enemies. This is Jesus. Like this is, 
he's described as a warrior. He's described as a as one with vengeance. He comes with vengeance. Isaiah just goes all out. He's going to be drenched in the blood of his enemies and our enemies. And I stained all of my clothing. Isaiah 34, we have to mention, in many ways, it's a sister prophecy. Like, it's so similar. They're so tied in. They're removed from each other. They're separated within the book. But Isaiah chapter 34 has already spoken of this eschatological slaughter. The Lord has a slaughter in Edom. So it's the same land. And he uses the language like of a great sacrifice, the fat of bulls and goats, and their land will be, it says, drenched with blood. Here he's soaked with blood. The land of Edom will be drenched with blood. And then in verse 8, in Isaiah 34, it says, why? Because the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. There is a jubilee coming. There is a deliverance coming for the controversy of Zion. And he puts right at the front of the center, why is he coming for all of these things? To save his people, Zion. As the rage of the nations it swirls and culminates against Israel during the time of Jacob's trouble, he comes back specifically to resolve the matter. He says, I'm going to vindicate them. I'm going to vindicate my name, but I'm actually going to save them as well. So don't think, if God's done with Israel, then Isaiah had no idea what he was talking about. It's very clear that the Lord at the end of the age comes back. And one of the driving reasons is for the controversy, for the hatred directed against his people. So we see that again here in Isaiah 63, verses 4 through 6. Why is he stomping his enemies like grapes? He says, for the day of vengeance is in my heart. I, every time I read this, I can feel it. It's not there in the text, and forgive me, but I can feel him saying, for the day of my vengeance has finally come. It's in my heart. He says, the year of my redemption has come. Very similar language in Isaiah 34 and Isaiah 63 has finally come. After all of the waiting, it has finally come. I looked and there was no one to help me. I was astonished there was no one to uphold. So he's hitting on something here. I did this all by myself. Now, is he all alone? Because in all of these other passages, Joel, he comes with myriads of his angels. You said that when he's revealed, we'll be with him. Why is he saying he's alone? We'll get to that. He says, I was, I was shocked. I was appalled that there was no one else to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation. What's my own arm? It's Jesus. The language here is very similar to who is found worthy in the book of Revelation. No one. No one other than the slain lamb is the only one in the same way that only he is worthy to accomplish atonement. He's the only one that's worthy to accomplish the vengeance of God. But it's not saying that he's all alone. He's saying, I accomplish this entirely by myself. Yes, the armies of heaven will be with him. The point is, this is not Jesus and the IDF. It's not the strength of the arm of the Lord and the arm of man. The strength of man, no. He's not all by himself, but he accomplishes these things entirely by himself. We hope you're enjoying this Maranatha Global Bible Study. wanted to take a quick minute here and ask you to consider something. Our highest priority as an organization is laying foundations where there are none in the 1040 window in accordance with Romans 15, to name the name where it's never been named. Now, if this is something that resonates with you, if you love the Maranatha message, proclaiming it to the ends of the earth at the end of the age, if this is something that resonates with you, I want to ask you to consider becoming a $5 monthly supporter of FAI. This is as crazy as it sounds, one of the most relevant and significant ways that you can support the work of the Great Commission through the FAI Global Family is by giving $5 a month. Because as the collective body of $5 givers a month grows, so too does our ability to increase our workforce on the ground and expand our initiatives and activities and operations in the Middle East in the 1040 window. So click on the link below for more information and consider starting today becoming a $5 monthly supporter of FAI. Thank you guys. And back to the teaching. Again, he says, my own arm brought salvation. My wrath upheld me. I trod the peoples down in my anger. I made them drunk with my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Again, their land will be soaked with blood. Now, this is basically saying the same thing. So again, when I say this, it's not that he's all by himself. 
It's saying the same thing that we saw back in Isaiah 59, and this is really the foundation of it, verses 15 and 16. The Lord saw that there was no man, and he was astonished, almost identical language, that there was no one to intercede. He goes, I was astonished there was no one to uphold. He's almost quoting the same statement. Then his own arm brought salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. Isaiah 59 is completely the context of which is the atonement. It's the atonement of God. It's the cross. Like, Jesus accomplished our salvation all by himself, okay? He didn't partner with anyone to do it. It's God sent provision for us. He sent his son to, to be mutilated for us. Likewise, the wrath of God will be fully, it, it's, that's, his, that's his wheelhouse. That's his, um, his job. So now we're just going to end this. We're going to look at a few verses in Isaiah 66 uh, as the book of Isaiah comes to a close. And again, it's not describing the procession or the march, but it adds some more beautiful descriptions of the return of Jesus. Behold, the Lord will come in fire, and his chariots like the whirlwind. The chariots of God, like I've mentioned this previously, the Lord's throne is a chariot. Ancient thrones in ancient times were carried oftentimes. At times they had wheels. It's a very strange picture. We see it in Ezekiel. You have all of this. What In Hebrew it's called Merkabah. Merkabah is the chariot throne of God. And you have portions of, for example, Ezekiel 1, some of the weird stuff in Ezekiel that describe this. And the wheels have eyes and, you know, like it's very mystical, strange stuff. Proceeding from his throne is a river of fire. He will purge everything by fire is a terrifying thing. It consumes and there's nothing left. You know, you think of cremation, like with my dad, you know, because of COVID and all. He didn't, I don't know, he probably didn't care if he was cremated, but usually Christians usually do a burial because it testifies concerning the resurrection of the body. Like this body is not just ashes to ashes, dust to dust type of thing, it will be raised up. Because of COVID, we had to cremate him, but just the, the idea that someone, a life, memories, there's just, there's nothing left, ashes. You think of people that get burnt, like fire consumes. It's a terrifying thing, and we all will be tested by fire. Our lives will be tested by fire. The Lord will come in fire, blazing fire. It's an absolutely terrifying thing. On Mount Sinai, the Lord came down in fire to the appearance of the sons of Israel. The entire top of the mountain was consumed in fire. Our God is a consuming fire. It's a, it's a terrifying reality. He comes in fire with his chariots like the whirlwind, like the, the storms. Like the whirlwind is, I mean, the cloud that led them through the desert probably looked like a whirlwind, like a tornado. But he comes in the, in the whirlwinds to render his anger with fury, his rebuke with flames of fire. Again, there's elements there that are figurative and symbolic. There are elements there that are quite literal. The Lord will execute judgment by fire and his sword on all flesh. Multiple references to the Lord coming back with a sword. We saw it all the way back there in Isaiah, I'm, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 33, the foundation text. Here Isaiah says it again. You see it prominently in Revelation. The sword comes out of his mouth with which he'll slay the wicked. Again, very symbolic there, but pointing to the reality of the Lord's judgments. And those who are slain by the Lord will be many. People don't like that, the idea. I mean, it says it clearly in Psalm 110. He will slay kings on the day of his wrath, heaping up the dead bodies throughout the earth. Many will be slain by the Lord. Christians are very uncomfortable. They go, well, I'm a red-letter Christian. I only believe in the soft-spoken Jesus of the Gospels type of thing. I mean, they, even that doesn't work. Because you see it in Luke. Jesus tells a parable where he's the king. He's always the king. And at the end of the parable, Jesus says, then the king will say on that day, bring all of these people that didn't want me to rule over them and slay them in my presence. Jesus told that parable. Like, I don't care, Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus will kill the wicked, he will slay the wicked when he comes back. It says in Isaiah 9, uh, Revelation 19, in, in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. Jesus is a man of war. We just looked at that in the previous session. Uh, 
So let me just end it by saying this, that Isaiah, like a masterful painter, he takes imagery from the previous desert prophecies, previous knowledge and information as this understanding of who the promised one is. Yes, he's going to be born. He's the seed of Eve, of Abraham, of Judah, of David. He'll be a human, but he's also coming back from heaven in blazing fire with myriads of his angels, the chariots of God, the horses and the chariots, the armies that are with him. We will be with him. Isaiah just takes all of this and he adds new beautiful poetry to it. He expands upon it. And like the like the flowers in the desert that will rejoice in bloom, Isaiah takes many of the prophecies of the coming of God and and through his lips they blossom. They open up, they expand. And it's just a there's so much here. There's so much here that I'd love to talk about. So in the next session we're going to jump into one of my favorite prophecies in the Bible, and that's the prophecy of Habakkuk. So look forward to doing that. Until then, God bless you all and Maranatha. Thank you.